This event is the first in the new Wheeler Centre series, broadly speaking, a collaboration between the Wheeler Centre, the State Library of Queensland and the RMIT Social and Global Studies Centre. And it's supported by Christina Campbell Pretty AM and family. Today's conversation is taking place across unceded sovereign land. The event stream comes to you from the Wheeler Centre on the lands of the Kulin Nation. I'm speaking to you from Canada in Treaty 6 Territory, homelands of First Nations and Métis people. Distinguished Professor Aileen Morton Robinson joins us from the lands of the Turrbal and Jagara people. We pay respects to these communities' elders, past, present and emerging, and to the elders of all communities and cultures that this conversation reaches. Distinguished Professor Aileen Morton Robin is a Gunpu woman of the Kwandamuka people in Morton Bay, and she's a professor of Indigenous research at RMIT University. She was appointed as Australia's first Indigenous Distinguished Professor in 2016 and was a founding member of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. She's the author of Talking Up to the White Woman, Indigenous Property, uh, Indigenous Women and Feminism um, by University of Queensland Press, The White Possessive, Property, Power and Indigenous Sovereignty by Minnesota Press, and she's the editor of several books, including Critical Indigenous Studies, Engagements in First World Locations from University of Arizona Press. And in two, 2020, this year, she was appointed a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the first ever Australian Indigenous scholar to be elected. I'm really grateful to Professor Bronwyn Fredericks, Pro Vice-Chancellor of Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland. She presented some bibliometric data in a recent speech celebrating Aileen's contribution to Australia's intellectual life. Talking Up to the White Woman has been nominated for multiple awards. It has never been out of print in 20 years. It has over a 1,000 citations and is in collections of at least 340 libraries all over the world. It's also taught in universities all over the world. Bronwyn also noted that Aileen was the 22nd Aboriginal person in Australia to get a PhD and only the 12th in a field other than theology. Speaking from the standpoint of a non-Indigenous queer white woman academic, I want to introduce Aileen, not only as an academic at the height of her powers, but also as a public intellectual. Now, there are many definitions of a public intellectual. The one I use here is someone who is well-trained in one or more academic disciplines, but is not subservient to them. That is, Aileen is someone whose work creatively engages academic theories and methods together with knowledge gained from her experience and the collective knowledge traditions. Um, and she's able to present a vision of the world that I think can help us survive and even thrive in these most challenging times. Okay, um, Aileen, I'm going to stop talking about you and uh, start talking with you. Uh, when we first met, which was over 20 years ago, I was a newly minted PhD who attended a conference um, at Griffith University that you organised. Something powerful happened to me after participating in an academic conference that put non-Indigenous people into conversation with Indigenous academics, professionals and activists. After that conference, we were invited to dinner with some of the academics involved, several of whom were other queer white women. You joined me outside to have a smoke, as we did in those days, and shortly after sitting down, you said, I think I'm colonising the lesbians. <laughs> and at that point, <laughs> 21 years ago, our friendship began. <laughs> Before that conference, <laughs> I'd understood whiteness, both as a serious problem for Indigenous and other Australians who weren't racialized as white, and as an identity that could be worn with more or less pride, more or less shame or guilt. After that conference, whiteness became visible to me as an object of research and as something which we all needed to take a stand on in our everyday lives as well as our professional um, careers. Having seen whiteness, I couldn't unsee whiteness and this meant I had to be prepared to change my ways of knowing and being in the academy and in the world. Once the subject position middle-class white woman became visible as a research problem, I was able to work in a different way. 
not only as a researcher but also as a teacher and as a non-Indigenous partner working on projects related to Indigenous knowledge that have reached thousands of people. This work is never easy or comfortable. Uh, it can be fun. Um, it always requires me to recognise and deal with my ignorance before I can offer any expertise. It requires me to understand and to account for the fact that I am never thinking and acting only as an individual, but also and always as part of an intergenerational and institutionalised set of discourses that operate to rationalise and defend, sometimes violently, the sovereignty of white possession in Australia. So even as I work to undo injustices, I always do so as part of a system that invests in the dispossession of Indigenous territories, cultures, languages and knowledges. And just one example of this is our legal system. It uh, enables a culture of impunity for offenders and violators of Indigenous sovereign countries, knowledges and bodies. So Aboriginal kids can be locked up um, for, um, as juvenile offenders for things like graffiti tagging or driving without a licence. But when white CEOs of mining companies drop the ball on Aboriginal heritage protections and literally detonate and obliterate um, spaces of Indigenous history, spirituality and knowledge, part of their million dollar bonuses are removed. Such corporate acts of ethnocide remind us that the problems that talking up to the white woman addressed 20 years ago remain very much um, and very literally part of our landscape. I want to begin early in your academic career. And I wondered, um, distinguished professor, if you would tell me a little bit about your research journey as an undergraduate and honours student. What were the disciplines that you studied at the Australian National University? What did you learn from your studies there? What do you think your teachers learned from you? Thank you, V. Easy question. Um, okay, so I basically studied sociology and anthropology. Um, I was the only Indigenous student as an undergraduate uh, in 1985 um, at the ANU, the Australian National University. Um, I began uni with basically a, a, a year seven um, education. I failed everything at uh, a high school. So I had to teach myself to uh, read and write, basically, f it, it, for the academy. Um, and, and I was absolutely petrified, I guess, of being there because I felt this was the last chance that I had to become qualified in some way, shape or form. Um, and I was there because I really wanted to learn about white knowledge, white people. It was... Um, something that I worked out as an activist that I didn't know enough. I didn't know enough about them um, and I didn't know enough about their knowledge. So my entering the university was really to find out about society, which is why I took sociology. And I wanted to know about anthropology in terms of how anthropology had constructed us. Um, so I was acutely aware in that political sense of why I was there and what I was supposed to learn. Um, and I think one of the um, first things I learned was um, how to reach I didn't know how to get 6,000 words down to 1,000 for the first essay I had to write. And uh, so I went along to the um, English as a second language unit to, um, uh, to talk to uh, Bridget Ballard, who was in charge of the unit, because um, I thought there was something wrong with me and maybe I 
didn't understand and I probably shouldn't be there. Um, anyway, so she she read my essay and then she, she just smiled and she said, look, this is really amazing but what you've got to learn to do is not to consider the relationships between everything and you're going to have to separate, um, you know, and disassociate and so... Um, I, when she said that to me, it was like the light bulb went on and I um, realised what I needed to do. So I did it. But I also kind of understood during that first year um, that I was uh, having an ontological or well an existential crisis, I guess, in the sense that I could see that I really had to think differently to the way in which I had been raised um, and the kind of cultural logics that informed uh, my being and doing in the world. Um, and that was... So I, so I guess at one level my experience was different to other... Um, undergrads that were around me because they were all kind of uh, concerned with the knowledge that we're being taught. Uh, so what these are the theories, whereas I was realising that there were things that informed the theories rather than... Like I could most of the time understand the theories, the logics of the theories themselves but I didn't kind of understand how these things got built. Um, and so going through the ANU, because it was, an, it was an amazing experience in the sense that I witnessed some of the best debates in my life between um, academics, uh, Jack Barbalay and Barry Hinders, for example, um, I engaged mainly with the professors. I didn't really debate with students that were in the class with me and I wasn't even consciously aware of that. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I'd met up with a friend, Ian Coates, we'd gone to uni together and he said to me, he said, oh, we all knew you were going to be a professor. And I said, well, I didn't think I was going to be a professor and he said oh well we all knew he said because you were the only one that would debate with them and and I thought did I and he said oh yeah he said we we knew we didn't really have to do a lot of work because we could go in the room and just watch you engage with with them and and I thought about it and I thought you know that's absolutely right I did do that and I was kind of like wasn't even conscious that that's what I was doing uh, because I was so wanting to le to learn and understand, um, but and I didn't think I'd be become an academic. Um, that again is a another story. But I didn't understand when I'd been offered honours in you know three disciplines in the first year that um, I didn't understand what honours was, and I tried to get clarification. Anyway, finally, um, somebody kind of did give me clarification. I still didn't want to do honours, but then, um, you know, my husband said to me, well, you know, like, you, you don't have to go down that road if you don't want to, but why don't you just do it because you can? And I did. So I graduated with first class honours out of uh, the ANU in sociology and uh, won an APA uh, and started actually a PhD in, on citizenship. But then because, you know, I was a mature age student with mortgage and stuff, I had to leave that one. But my entrance into the academy um, really took off, I guess, after the book and that was the appointment at uh, in women's studies um, at Flinders University. But I have never been able to secure a job in sociology um, and have never been interviewed for a job, and despite I've 
applying um, because I, I'm told that I'm not a sociologist. And uh, I, I find that often very interesting because I see people with undergraduate degrees in social work um, and they do a PhD in sociology and, they, and they be, they're understood as a sociologist and yet the work is quite mediocre and you can see it because they don't have that uh, ground, that theoretical grounding that you get in an undergraduate, you know, program uh, and in an honours program. Anyway, I have always in that sense therefore been contained, you know, women's studies was something I did. Uh, I taught justice studies but mainly I couldn't get jobs other than in Indigenous studies, despite the fact I didn't do Indigenous studies as, uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, you know, and that's, that's fundamentally a statement or an indictment on the racist logics that informs uh, what Aboriginal scholars can be or can't be. So even though we can go through and basically be you know, go, we, we're in mainstream. We get a mainstream degree. This is not an Aboriginal degree. Um, but once you come out the other end, the only thing you can do is Indigenous studies. Um, you know, and I, I, I mean, how does that work, <laughs> you know, uh, other than through racism? Um, and so when they talk about you know, trying to recruit Indigenous scholars to universities. What they mean is we want to recruit Indigenous students to universities uh, in Indigenous studies, right? Um, we don't want to um, employ Indigenous scholars who graduate in education to teach, you know, um, early childhood, um, you know, we just have to give them the subject of Indigenous and early childhood to teach. So uh, even the way in which we are understood as scholars is very much through the prism of race. And has Thank been, you. Right. Oh, <laughs> <It> has, so <laughs> I guess that speaks to the journey. Yeah, no, that's a really, um, I think it tells us a lot. And I think it tells us a lot about um, talking up to the white woman and certain aspects of its reception, which we might talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, but just that uh, challenge where the centre of your expertise is on um, social constructions of gender and in particular the subject position of the middle-class white woman and how that pervades um, discourses and institutions throughout um, Australia and that you can understand, given that background, the challenge that, that was. Um, so I want to talk about the really innovative structure of talking up to the white woman because by then you had absolutely hit your strides and you've never looked back. Um, and just um, to uh, familiarise um, readers uh, with this book, it begins with an explanation of Indigenous women's identity and relationality and moves through Indigenous women's life writings to explore the persistence of an anthropological gaze through white feminist debates on violence um, against Indigenous women within Indigenous communities, um, the Bell Huggins debate. Then it moves on um, to demonstrate the invisibility of the subject position middle-class white woman to white feminists who are engaged in anti-racist teaching and advocacy. And the book concludes with an overview of the national and international human rights activism of Indigenous women over generations. And just thinking about that structure, um, it's almost like there's this containment um, of this subject position of the middle class white woman that has shaped white feminism so much. And what you seem to do is frame um, that subject within this sustained 
detailed and generous education about the history and experiences of Indigenous women, both in their everyday lives through the um, life narratives as domestic servants, as mothers, as daughters and as friends, and in their expression of Indigenous sovereignty in the various contexts of um, state, national and international um, political uh, forums. So in addition to, um, I guess, um, centering the knowledge work of Indigenous women, there's, I think, an understanding that white feminist discourses of, on gender tend to efface the operation of race, except when race is referred to as an expression of an ethnic or a, um, Indigenous cultural difference that can be celebrated um, or included um, at least as part of a national story. And another thing that I noticed rereading this book is that you never simply um, simplify the broad political um, project of feminism and that there's quite a detail, very detailed account of first wave, second wave, socialist, Marxist, post-structuralist, post-modern women of colour, queer and eco-feminisms. Um, not only does that make your book one of the earliest intersectional um, studies of um, gender politics, I think this complexity informs your analysis in important ways, um, navigating through these feminisms. So what I wanted to ask you is you're reflecting 20 years later um, on subsequent work on Indigenous women and feminism. What do you see as some of the most important methodological and theoretical innovations of talking up to the white woman? Right. I think that the, the medical, methodological innovation of it is that I tried to basically um, create a, um, an interdiscourse um, entanglement and I've structured the book so that chapters spoke to one another as you moved through with the thread of middle-class white woman uh, being woven uh, through them because that is the subject position that we are measured against and by. Um, I think that at the time I was trying to really... Um, bring things into conversation to not only, I guess, inform white feminists about Indigenous women's issues and, and positions, but also Indigenous women's positions in relation to feminism. So it was to create a... Um, I guess, uh, in some ways, a, a dialectic which never really came off. Um, and I, I put that down probably to the Marxist training. Um, and ja I'll hold Jack Barbelay responsible for that. Um, so I think that I, I tried to pursue um, an, an innovative methodology where Indigenous knowledges are operationalised but I also wanted to show that my training, um, at, you know, as a, as a sociologist uh, was being operationalised um, and, and for those two things to come together. Hence, you know, I started to talk about standpoint uh, in the beginning of the book, which I've subsequently um, expanded in, in, in work in later years. But it, it, it's a book that um, I might add, it's actually a book I wrote in, well, that dissertation was two years. Uh, so when I was uh, immersed in it, I was totally immersed in it. And I, again, wanted to know and understand, but I wanted to bring knowledge and understanding to those that actually would read it. So it, it was, as much as it was a um, intellectual intervention and a new way of doing discourse analysis, uh, it was also um, a way, a, pol a politics was to bring uh, women into conversation. 
happening? Um, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about uh, building on that point uh, with the title itself because I think the title suggests a different kind of relationship to academic knowledge and communication. You're not talking as, you're not talking for, you're not talking from, you're not talking with. Um, and I think that really stages this political relationship that's at the heart of this challenge yep. to a certain, um, to a, a whole lot of white feminist um, knowledges and activisms. Um, I just want to ask you about how you imagine the audiences for talking up to the white woman, you know, in those two years when you're just immersed to it and, and, and writing it. And, you know, were there some audience that were most important for you to reach? And, you know, what surprised you most about the responses of some of the actual audiences um, to, to the book? Right. I, I, um, so, the audience? Yeah. <laughs> what happens when you talk up? <laughs> so the, the audience that I really wanted to reach was Indigenous women. You know, I wanted to celebrate the amazing strengths and knowledge production of Aboriginal women and to put quite firmly a sovereign position to say, this is who we are, this is what we think and this is what we know, right? And that reality to some degree is incrementable with, with being a white woman. And you know what? That's okay, right? Because we don't aspire to be white women. You know, just as I'm sure if we asked, you know, a whole room full of white women to put up their hand if they want to be Aboriginal women, not a lot of them would stand up. Um, you know, so I, I really wanted this work to claim a sovereign space within the academy to also say we have arrived, right? We have arrived and we can engage and we will because this is our land and you are on it and you are here illegally. And you have to deal with that as part of the history of this country. So in the formation of the middle class white woman, that very much is tied to colonialism. Yeah? And so that's the other dimension of the book. It basically is trying to say, to understand how gender is socially constructed through colonialism. You know, un understand this, that you are a product of empire and your politics are still very much tied to that. Your politics come out of the Enlightenment, right? They come out of the Enlightenment. But that Enlightenment also was the impetus for colonisation and the spread of empire. And so you cannot um, assume a position of innocence within a politics that actually is epistemologically connected to a process of dispossession of Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and an another question um, about this, this important book is um, the cover. Mm. And that women from your Stradbroke Island community, family members, um, including family members, were um, pictured on the um, cover and they're pictured on the um, new edition. Um, when you were writing a new preface earlier this mm -hmm. year, how was the knowledge of these women present in your current reflections about Indigenous women's relation to white feminism? Uh, then their knowledge is very much a part of who I am because I am not um, an individual. I am somebody who is always in relation to my um, female uh, relatives, my 
creator beings and the country. So I I basically wanted to complicate the the visual representation of what people think Aboriginal women look like, uh, you know, but that was also because all the women on that cover see themselves in terms of whether they're Gurren Pool, you know, Waradri, whatever, they're on there as these with strong women, knowledgeable women, you know, women who have grown me up um, and women who are also my titters and uh, my sisters, um, so and and my grand nieces as, and my grandchildren as as are on there now, but I am only who I am through my relationships with all of them. Yeah, so they very much shape uh, the way that I think, be, and do. Thank you. When you visited the University of Alberta a couple of years ago you made a memorable statement. Indigenous people don't need Foucault. <laughs> At least one early career Indigenous researcher found that statement very empowering as she completed her original PhD research. I thought, hang on. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, concepts developed by the historian and political theorist um, Michel Foucault uh, and prison activist, of course, um, and um, mental health activist. Um, so um, concepts developed by him, including epistemes, discourse, counter discourse, have been quite important to some of your uh, arguments mm -hmm. about knowledge, power, and sovereignty. Yep. So I wondered if you could um, share a little bit about the ways that you do <laughs> and don't um, draw inspiration from this important, uh, other important thinker in your own work? Um, I think what Foucault did for me was make me understand how um, disciplinary knowledge is produced. He gave me an understanding of the way in which the epistemy was developed in the Enlightenment and that how that continues to structure the way that we think about the world and are in the world. So I really, um, you know, I, I love his work because he is so queer and he, th you know, even though he's against the Enlightenment at one sense in the way in which he's trying to produce knowledge, he is still very much a a product of it so he never gets out of that that epistemy and he made me um, think about power in uh, ways in which I hadn't been taught in my undergraduate degree so for him to kind of talk to me about you know relation power as being relational as being you know, enabling as much as it is, uh, you know, containing, I could understand and I guess relate to that. But the problem with Foucault and the limits, and he admits that there are limits to the way in which he has envisaged power, the limits of that is in when you come up with another form of power. So when you, and he, he doesn't take into consideration the power of Mother Earth. So his power is always restricted to the human production of it, not the fact that power can exist elsewhere in different forms that actually circumscribe our power. And we are at this very moment in history understanding that. Um, so, and so I could bring Indigenous uh, understandings of power through relatedness into a conversation with him. And it allowed me to see the limitations of what he'd done, but he had he gave me a window to look through to basically see where these people's ways of being and knowing in the world came from, and he gave me 
um, a way to understand white Western logics. So I, um, I mean, he's only one, but but for me, he is probably someone that I, you know, how you want to have that. Uh, when you have the wish list about who you want to have dinner with, he w- he would be <laughs> right there, you know. He would be right there, um, and my grandfather. I'd love it. Would have loved him to have met my grandfather. Um, so I think that um, that's the importance of Foucault for me. Now, why I raise my grandfather, who was an amazing philosopher. Um, I do tell the story about how I was asked not to return to Sunday school on Dunwich because uh, I was seen as being disruptive. And uh, so when um, my grandfather and grandmother went to the church to find out what I'd done, uh, they basically explained that I was asking really um, rude questions like, you know, one of the instances apparently we were all singing Jesus loves all the children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all the children in his sight, right? And then we had to go into the Bible reading lessons for kids and I'm like seeing all these kids are white, so, like, I'm asking the questions, like, where are the black kids? Where are the red kids? Where are the yellow kids? Um, and so that was not good. And then I listened to them talk about Jesus and turning the other cheek and stuff. So I'd, you know, stick my hand up and say, well, how, how many times do you have to turn the cheek when, you know, why does my grandmother have to go down the back of the stairs, the back of the store to be served? You know, why is it that we're always pushed out of lines when we go to town? Why do my grandparents get spit on? So I was really trying to understand this notion of the Christian. Um, and and the hypocrisy, mm, mm, mm. you know, and, and, and I'm, you know, 11 going on 12 with this. So what what happens is I go, so I come home and my great my parents um, would send the other kids to church, but my job was I got given uh, the Communist Manifesto and the Bible and my grandfather said to me, these are two... Uh, white fellows ideas of philosophy and he used that term he said you need to read them and you need to understand them and we will have discussions so that was my Sunday and you, you know so I grew up in this household of these amazing grandparents my grandparents they, they only went to year three on the mission and they had this amazing um, understanding of the world and what was in the world. Like they were, they would have discussions about John F. Kennedy. They would have discussions about Martin Luther King. So I grew up in a household where um, I was empowered by these wonderful old people. I don't know if I've answered your question, Fink. <laughs> Um, I don't think Foucault was your first theorist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I hear that you're working um, on a new book manuscript that extends some of the work on talking up to the white woman to provide a new theoretical framework for understanding Indigenous social constructions of identity, sovereignty and gender. And um, I wondered if you'd be prepared to talk about some of the most interesting things you've learned um, about Indigenous social constructions of gender in the archives. And maybe you might want to talk a bit about Lizzie and her English lessons. (laughs) Yep. So I think that one of the interesting things about doing and reading archival materials is that for me, and I'm doing my work on the women of Quantamooka on the frontier, uh, is that I'm, I'm reading things that I already know. 
So it through oral history, right? So it becomes a really interesting take on the archive methodologically. Yeah, um, and I'm absolutely um, amazed at Quantum Mooka women. And speaking of Lizzie, um, she uh, would visit um, a guy by the name of Gustavus Birch uh, out at out at Paul and Paul out at Amity on Stradbroke, and she would invent. Um, chores for him to do and then she just um, appropriate the calico and the soap and this poor lad reads like he's writing about the two things he's obsessed with the Lizzie and constipation right and and the fact that Lizzie's not putting it out for him you know and just Despite the fact that he's trying to teach her English and, you know, he lets her basically take soap and that. Lizzie is not putting it out. And Lizzie is putting it out for her husband and whoever she wants, except she's not putting it out for him. So in reading, like reading what he's writing, and of course he doesn't talk about it as putting it, but it is, it's it's just comedy like the diary when you so she says things to him like and this is again is about you know the autonomy of this woman and the strength of this woman and how she's working with relations because there's other women involved in the ruse but she does things to him like she says oh there's a whole heap of mullop up in Wallen Creek so can you get your rifle and go and shoot some now I'm just saying who gets like, who believes you can go and shoot a fish, especially a mullet? And the fact that he just goes and does this, and when he gets back, she's cleaned him out, right, of, of his stuff. So what <laughs> – so <laughs> – and she, she does, does other things like – she tells him, now, this is in the middle of the date, oh, there's bandicoots down eating your pumpkins. Now, bandicoots <laughs> don't come out in the middle of the day, right? So she does <laughs> – kind of does this stuff and he goes and, of course, when he comes back, all of his stuff's gone. And so there's a great deal in, uh, in which I see Lizzie – as practising her sovereignty, she's in a particular relationship with this lad in which she's appropriating um, and she is doing it fundamentally by tricking him but also through kindness because she basically subjects herself to his English lessons in order to have to set up this relationship. And her, um, you know... Determining who she will be intimate with and who she won't, um, and still abiding by the by the law. So she's she's married proper way, but she um, is you know de- deciding. Well, she might go and you know have sex over here, um, and tomorrow she might go back to the husband. So what you see, and and she's only one where this kind of um, understanding of her um, sovereignty in that she's exercising her rights within the context of kinship rights and relations to land. So, so I'm trying to think through more about the configuration of gender and sovereignty through kinship, ancestral beings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so she's she's one like I said that's making me. Think think more about um, Aboriginal women because we are written up, as you know, in, in, in history as particularly on the frontier as being victims, you know, being uh, women that don't have agency, we're sexually promiscuous or we're slaves. Like it's, it's the representation and what uh, the quantum, you know, in doing this work on the Quandamooka archives and the women, what it does is it shows this amazing agency. Like they were the reconnaissance for the war. They, the women, and, and the white soldiers know this, right? They finally twig 
that it's the women who do the reconnaissance because the next day they're hit. Um, and, you know, that kind of and, – and they also uh, fight. That's the other thing. So they – so there's a whole heap of rethinking that needs to be done in terms of those representations again of what, you know, Aboriginal women's gender roles are. Um, and I think that because the lens by which uh, those representations are being constructed position those women on the, on the, uh, on the frontier um, as as victims, basically, or as, in terms of passivity, they don't really understand the dynamics of the use of passivity as well as the ways in which they, Aboriginal women strategised. And I'm, you know, just giving an example of Lizzie, right? And, and Lizzie is distributing those goods amongst her network, so we need to kind of think, well, mm. we don't. I mean, mm. I know the women on, on – I come from very strong, amazing women um, and that doesn't just happen overnight. You know, the strength and the resilience of the Kondamooka women um, is well documented in the archives. So I, I don't know if I've – Answered your question, V. Yeah, I think I think it's kind of your archival turn, <laughs> and it does. You know, it is extending like these um, uh, indigenous cultural constructions of gender in in a whole lot of ways that are very concrete and that bring together um, both that oral history and that archival material to produce a different understanding of um, how identity works and how power works and how conceptions of identity or preconceptions on the frontier, you know, were subverted um, in ways that um, um, enforce the um, pre-existing sovereignty of those women. So, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's quite clear. Uh, um, I've, I've also been thinking about your more recent contributions to cultural studies and um, in particular something I've been thinking about is the distinction between what is often called identity politics by conservative thinkers and alt-right activists and um, the politics of culture, uh, which is where we study um, how power works through social institutions and discourses and practices. Um, I know you've been working on Aboriginalia and I wondered if you would um, just talk a little about what Aboriginalia is and how you understand its cultural and ideological significance as an expert on uh, whiteness and gender. Okay, well, Aboriginalia yeah, is kind of um, material that was produced by um, white men and women from really the turn of the century until the 1970s. A lot of it is on ceramics. So utilising Aboriginal motifs and um, uh, images, like appropriating and, and creating representations. And it was seen as a way of branding Australia. This is the iconic or the uniqueness of Australia uh, was to represent supposedly Aboriginal art or, and people on, you know, objects. And I, you know, really have been trying to think through that and to understand the idea of representation, not just as re, a representation, but representation in terms of how the, the representation in t itself brings into being an epistemological possession. So when you actually portray or draw Aboriginal people on plates, 
you're bringing into being an image that's supposed to reflect something. But in that very process, is you're creating this epistemological possession, right? So it's so ownership is very much a part of the construction, the representation. So even though it's a, a representation in that it isn't something that reflects reality, um, it is actually something that is also taken into possession in bringing it into being, yeah? So I'm trying to think about that in terms of the way in which it is a particular kind of white possessive aesthetic at work and how that white possessive aesthetic utilises and operationalises the Aboriginal body and symbols to... um, say that this is what's unique around Australia, but at the same time totally erases Indigenous sovereignty and the history of colonisation in this country in the very uh, production of the epistemological possession. Yep. So I'm looking at how these things, which are collected by Aboriginal people as well, I might say, and, as, and you know, non-Aboriginal people, They were mainly produced by immigrants, uh, you know, particularly after the First War. And um, they are, they are interesting objects that have a social life that were meant to create, you know, a particular production of national identity that at the same time is erased in terms of the real bodies, the real people. So this stuff is happening while we're on reserves, we're on missions, you know, children are being stolen, um, taken away, Um, legislation is becoming far more uh, containing, the surveillance becomes heightened. So this is what they're actually redoing to real Aboriginal people. At the same time as they're drawing them and they're utilising our art uh, on on these, um, these objects, um, and I find that kind of um, contradiction just permeates very much the way in which Australia sees itself. So on the one hand, we can paint a Qantas plane and have Aboriginal, you know, stylistic iconography but we can incarcerate Aboriginal people and children. We can put 10-year-olds in jail. We can refuse your sovereignty. We can basically um, continue to perpetrate your poor health through lack of resources. We cannot basically allow you to become a part of the economy. Instead, we structure through administrative and legal discourse your reliant on the state. So the people don't understand that through administrative and legal um, or legislative uh, works, Aboriginal people are incorporated into the state in particular ways that don't enable our disassociation and separation from the state. Um, in, instead, we, in a lot of cases, mm. Mm. Uh, in terms of the welfare dollar, are the things that prop up economies. If you were to take out out all of the welfare dollar out of Alice Springs, that economy would fall over tomorrow, right? Mm. So, you know, welfare is always been a means of actually injecting money into the economy. Can we please think about this in terms Mm. of Mm. job seeker? Can we think about this in the way in which the state is actually responding to the virus? Mm-hmm. And that is what, they're the logics that it utilises with Aboriginal people. Thank you. It's like a, a um, aesthetics of containment. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I've, I've, this, 
folks, um, check out this work. It's, it's, it's really great. Um, uh, at this particular time that many are calling the Anthropocene, there have been some renewed calls to reconsider foundational arguments of ecofeminism. Mm -hmm. I just wanted um, to hear from you about how well you think that ecofeminism um, has taken on board Indigenous women's knowledge as it relates mm -hmm. to catastrophic climate change and how you see the, I guess, like the question with Foucault, some of the... the um, possibilities but also some of the limitations of that um, at just w where we find ourselves. I think that ecofeminists on, on the ground um, are trying to work with Indigenous communities to uh, take care of land and to put in place more sustainable um, you know, if it's in terms of food production, et cetera. But the logics of ecofeminism are still very much in the sense of a contractual relationship. And what I mean by that, when it's the, the earth, is, they're not, it's not about being seen as being or understanding yourself as being in and of the earth. It's still a sense in which the human is contracting to utilise in some way the earth. And I think that there is, there, that's a fundamental difference in the way in which Indigenous people uh, understand themselves and their relationship to being in and of the earth. So when we talk about sovereignty, it is not through the logics of basically that being conferred from a god that gave it to a king that then operationalised it in terms of democracy, right? So that ontological roots of the Westphalian notion of sovereignty, which also determines the relationships with the earth, is different to the way in which Indigenous peoples configured their sovereignty that is being in relations with um, non-humans, uh, that's plants, that's all living things, and trying, and trying to uh, be a good relative, like being in good relations um, is... A, is the way in which we understand ourselves as not being worth any more or any less than every other living thing. So your, your being is really determined by the relations that you're in with everything. Um, and capitalism, you know, precludes that uh, to some degree. And some of us still you know, understand and were basic and were – like my it's, – it's a hard thing to – I try to uh, talk about how – what it is like to feel that you're walking on something living. You know, if you can imagine that. And I grew up with that, that we are – Working, walking on something living. So you take care in basically how you treat that living thing that you're actually a part of and sustained by, but you're also walking on it. So that sense of respect, even to think about where you put your feet. Like, how, how many people do you think get up out of bed every morning and think the heaviness of what capitalism has produced for the planet? And, you know, you might think I'm mad, but a lot of the, the, um, the volcanist, uh, volcanist or whatever, I probably haven't got the correct term, who monitor volcanoes basically said that first big lockdown, the earth, was quiet and our imprinted, like the, the, our noise and our vibration 
when it went, it was like the planet was breathing. The animals were coming out. You know, plants were responding in particular ways. So uh, what I'm saying is not some kind of, um, you know, craziness. It's actually seeking to conceptualise the planet and our relations with it in a different way. We have to think differently. We cannot mm. continue, mm. And, mm. you know, to think the way that we do. It. And it's, um, you know, understanding first and foremost that we are nothing without it is the earth that sustains us and it's the power of the earth that can also destroy us so that Foucauldian notion which is still human-centered power like it's all human-centered power all western theory is human-centered mm. power right mm. um mm. that has to be changed mm. 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 you know we can't continue to think that humans have the power mm. Not everything can be made commensurable no, with that. No, that that ideology. No. Um, we're getting towards the end That's of this conversation, good, Fiona. <laughs> and I feel that um, uh, I'd like to share a question from one of our audience okay. members. Um, what are your tips on building resilience for academics of colour who are uh, trying to navigate and survive white academia? I imagine you'd have a few. Mm, I don't know if I'm really good at giving tips. I mm. think um, the only – look, I survive, I believe, because I try and understand human-centred power in its multiple forms and – I try to outmanoeuvre and um, work in that kind of context. But one must always have uh, things that sustains the self. Uh, it's difficult for me to respond and, to, is, you know, to say, you know, uh, women of colour because I don't know culturally where you come from. I don't... I don't know that all I can, all I know is that um, I center myself in terms of my country and uh, my ancestors and the um, the place and I carry that me I'm, I'm not dis disassociated from it just because I'm in the academy um, and I think that's something that a lot of vice chancellors have found really difficult to understand. You know that I, I act sovereign. So in terms of tips, I'm not I'm not sure because I I think what for me it's about is what is your relationship to the indigenous sovereignty that still prevails where you are. And how are you setting up relations with the traditional owners in the university where you are? You know, like there's, there's you know, re resilience occurs, I think, uh, through many forms. Um, and I, I honestly don't know um, if I could come up with a list of tips um, it, you know, it's yeah because I'm not an I'm not I'm I'm not I'm only in and out of place when I'm on other people's country. Yeah, so when I'm in and out of place, I know that there are protocols that I have to abide by, but I also know that I'm a stranger on somebody else's land, this country, and so my capacity to I think. Um, do things is again only in relation to others. Yep. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm. I don't. People ask me about you know um, 
resilience and about how I do what I do, I only know that I do what I do because of the people and country I come from. And I don't... That's kind of unwavering in everything I do. Thank you, um, distinguished Professor Morton Robinson. And thanks to everyone. Um, I hear there's quite a lot of you for um, watching this. I hope you've learned as much as I have. Um, I never leave a conversation with you um, without learning something um, very, very new and, and also without learning how to think differently. So um, thanks um, to those of uh, you who are viewing this. If you haven't done this already, please do yourselves a favour, purchase a copy of the second edition of Talking Up to the White Woman. Um, it has some extras in the preface and, and in the end. Um, it's published by University of Queensland Press and um, you can purchase it through your local independent bookstore. Uh, Neighbourhood Books are the official online bookseller for this event, so you could go there. And thank you, Fee, for, as always, being as engaging and, um, you know, your... If I could... Uh, there was a question I know about how to, how to be an ally. I think you and I have discussed it's not about uh, being an ally... It's really, I think, about being in good relations and that's mm. something that you and I have had for decades. Um, so you're the person that should really <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> well, may, maybe we'll speak again <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and, and share that secret. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but I, I, I think we need we to have wind to go. up. Okay. I think so. Thank you, everyone. So. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.